Hey, this is Kieran, Coach's Corner Chats, and joining me is David Diani. David, where are you at and what are you up to? Well, thanks for having me. I'm at the University of Iowa, head coach of uh, the women's soccer program, and I've been here for nine years. And we're in the middle of the spring or end of the spring. What were some of the things that you were trying to accomplish as you're transitioning to the summer? Well, I think, you know, when you're in the Big Ten, um, the expectations are that you – both as a program and as individuals that you got to get better. Um, you've got to be bought into the process. Uh, that takes a commitment level, not only just during the nine months uh, that you have your student athletes, but you know, you give them a couple of weeks off in the summer and they're heading into heading into getting better and building that foundation ready for August. So, you know, very much um, whether it be the spring or the fall, we're very much driven into the process. We fall in love with getting better. Um, we try to recruit student athletes that are growth minded. And, uh, for us, we were very young this spring. We graduated 13 seniors from the fall. Um, some very talented seniors that have been in our program, uh, and played a lot of minutes for four years. Um, and so we brought in three high school seniors that graduated early. Uh, we had, um, another 12 uh, that were either freshmen, two freshmen or sophomores. So we had a pretty young team led by some, uh, some, some really experienced juniors and a senior that's going to take her COVID year, but they're over, they were overmatched in terms of numbers. And so they had to lead by example and we had to create, you know, a, a foundation of what it looks like to work hard and to uh, to be attention to detail minded and and get better. And it's hard. Um, and I would say that it took us a couple months to be able to find our rhythm. But we ended uh, the spring both playing well on the field, uh, making major strides in the classroom and also on the in the in the weight room. You talk about finding your rhythm. When you look at your nine years there, what have wh how has Iowa's soccer program grown uh, under your tutelage? I mean, it's it's been night and day. I was actually uh, ironically just texting with Ron Rainey. Uh, there was the who's the head coach before I got got here, and he went to Dartmouth um, after being at the University of Iowa. Wonderful guy, and uh, he's returned down to, to division three school in Albion now in Michigan. And, uh, we we're just talking about the growth that's changed. It's, you know, not only the conference, you know, the big 10 has changed a lot. It's, uh, not, not, you know, they're not 10 institutions anymore. There are 14 and we're about to add two more to go to 16 with USC and UCLA. Um, you know, that, that has changed the level of, of, uh, talent in the big 10 has changed, uh, it's, there are no easy wins anymore. Uh, it's very difficult, um, which then demands your best. Um, I would say that as a, as an institution in our, our, you know, in our program, uh, it's changing, you know, the easiest change is to be able to see the resources that we have now. Uh, we have a new four and a half million dollar soccer operations building that sits right beside our, our, uh, our facility um, the bells and whistles that exist on our field now. Um, our biggest thing for me in nine years was having a, a functional program for our student athletes. Can they go to one location? Can they, can they get everything they need to be a great student athlete in that one location, whether it be ice baths, a weight room, uh, nutrition, all of those things. And I think, um, you know, going through that, that, that fundraising piece about two years ago during right before COVID, actually, I'm glad we got it done before the pandemic uh, that helped us kind of put one of the final pieces of what we feel like is needed for not only recruiting, but also functionality part within our, uh, you know, for the student athletes that have already committed to be Hawkeyes. So I think that's a big piece. And then, you know, we've added our, my staff has tripled in size. We have a director of ops. We're about to get a fourth full-time coach. Uh, we have two managers that are on stipend. So the administration have said they want to be good in women's soccer. They want to be relevant in the Big Ten. And um, and now it's our job to be able to, to uh, accomplish that. I was just about to say, how important or helpful is it when you hear that the admin above you says, hey, this is where we want to get to. We'll support you. We'll give what we can to help you be successful. 
I, you know, it, it's, it's paramount. I think for me, I was hired with a different administration and they were, they were fantastic. And I, I owe a lot to them to, uh, to have taken a chance on a division two um, head coach uh, that was successful, but he was a division two head coach and not everyone would do that, but to have administration that understand that there are resources that are needed to be successful. And that could be in coaching, that could be staff, that could be, uh, administ- you know, liaison, administrative support. That could be some, for some people that scholarships. Uh, a lot of it's budget related to travel, how you need to travel. And we're not talking about taking charters. We're just talking about not taking buses on a nine hour trip, you know, to, uh, to Michigan or to, um, to, you know, Penn state. So that's important, but it also, I think the biggest thing for administration are, um, having a good relationship with your head coach, having good relationship with the student athletes, Matt Henderson, our sported men, he, our student athletes know who he is. He comes to practice, he comes out with a cup of coffee, he watches, he doesn't say anything. He just says, hi, he just wants to be out there. It's the best part of his day. He comes out on, he comes out on, on some trips in the fall and the spring for us. So when you have a relationship with the coach and the student athletes, you can, you can have a good conversation. You can have a good platform for discussion. Uh, and he knows every one of our student athletes, the ins and outs of who they are as well. And that's really important for a coach to know that you have support when, um, you know, it's not always going to be hundred percent successful. And he knows, you know, uh, you know, he knows everything about the, the program. So I think that's paramount. Um, I think honestly, you ask any head coach at a, at any level, if you do not have administrative support, you feel like you're on an island. Let's go all the way back. Were you a soccer player as a youth? Like, when did you start kicking the ball around? So I I'm born and raised in Ontario, Canada. So I'm Canadian. So I um, was born with skates on. Literally, I I played hockey my whole life. But really, most of my childhood, up until I came to the United States, was hockey and soccer. Just kind of dual. I played basketball for sure in high school and played football, but it ultimately it was hockey and soccer. And at some point, hockey just became something that I couldn't do anymore as I was going through the junior ranks. It just wasn't good enough. Um, got drafted. It was great, but it just – you can't do much when you're five five in the NHL. Or, you know, semi, you know, semi-pro. So um, I, I transitioned to a little bit more of a focus on soccer. Um, had some, mo- some moments, cup of coffees every year with the Canadian national uh, pool, uh, provincial pools. Um, but it became evident that, you know, I, if I wanted to keep playing and I, I just – I was going to have to go to the U.S., um, went to Spring Arbor, you know, college at the time. Now it's Spring Arbor University. And uh, played there for four years. And what I loved about the NAI, you know, level was that I could do, uh, I met my wife there, I met my friends, my best friends there, but I could do a lot of other things. And it just wasn't soccer at school. So I started, uh, I started coaching uh, at Jackson Lumen Christie. I was a varsity coach uh, at the age of 20. And honestly, that started where I'm at now. I've always been a head coach other than um, three years at Hillsdale College where I was a part-time assistant for men and women. Um, But I just kind of like was trial and error, trial and error, trial and error. And I started with high school and um, got a teaching job at Jackson Lima Christie for six years and kind of did both and did ODP in Michigan and Finally just said, enough's enough. Let's see if I can give this a go full time and applied to Grand Valley State and was lucky enough to be able to get the job there. So what was it that was like the impetus or the spur that caused you at the age of 20 to say, hey, I'd like to take on even at the high school level and start coaching? Well, I was a good player, but I wasn't a great player. So that was part of it. Um, you know, I, I at that point, it was ironic because I didn't feel like I had committed everything I needed to do to be a student athlete. And that's probably why I am the way I am as a coach now. And uh, looking back, I had, you know, but I had a decent career. Um, I think ultimately I love teaching. I graduated as a, with education. I love teaching. I believe that coaching is teaching as well. 
um, and just teaching in a different forum, you know, different platforms. So I've always loved teaching. My parents were teachers. I think the combination of coaching, uh, I love the sport. I love the development part. The investment needed to be successful. I love the process. I've always, you know, I remember at the age of 20, 21, looking at Anson Dorrance YouTube stuff and, and going like, I love the competitiveness, the competitive cauldron. So I all, those things were always passions for me. And, um, you know, I'd run a training and then go up. Oh, yep. Yeah, that wasn't good. You know, okay. That's out the door. I'll try it again. And, but I was good at building relationships and I have a lot of flaws, but I, I am good at building relationships. I love to teach. I love to coach. Uh, I have a lot of passion and I think, um, soccer was just my truest love at the time and just became even more so now. And, um, it just gave me a platform to be doing something other than just teaching in the classroom. How important has it been for you? To, you've talked about recognizing, at least in the hockey realm, that there was a point where you, there was a ceiling for you in terms of your potential. And same thing with soccer, like you were good, but it was going to take a lot to go to the next level. How important, and, op, and op also kind of recognizing when a session doesn't go as well, how important is that ability to be self-aware and to not always be positive, but also be able to look at some of the not-so-great parts? Uh, I think it's one of the most incredible uh, incredibly important ingredients to being success, a successful mentor, role model, uh, teacher, educator, coach, however you want to, whatever platform that is about mentoring uh, others and teaching skills. I think, you know, I believe that there are growth minded people, uh, individuals in life, and those people are constantly uh, self evaluating and constantly. Um, growing in who they are, uh, in, in whatever fashion, uh, they, they deem, you know, profession, it could be, um, institution could be as a coach. It doesn't matter. I, I, I believe that's paramount. I, we talk a little bit in our program about being, being, um, being, being scared about being caught, being scared about being paranoid about being caught in and not growing and others bypassing you. And I think that that healthy paranoia of wanting to grow and, and not being complacent, I think is really important. I think it's, it, it also helps you analyze um, what's needed, not just for yourself, but for others. And, and I think that is one of the greatest, like every mentor I have is somebody that was paranoid and was a growth minded individual. So you get the jump to Grand Valley State. When you get there, what are some of the things that you try to put in place to hopefully build a successful program? I think early on it was, um, I won a lot at the, the high school level and I knew that my coaching uh, resume and what I meant by that is like, my coaching resume in terms of my knowledge on how to coach the game, the details, the, the tactics, um, how to put together a, a, a really clean session, how to, how to speak to players during the session. That has always been something that's been catching up to my passion to, to mentor and, and, um, and uh, just teach the game. Um, so at Grand Valley, while I was, learning a lot of those skills, um, I tried to create a competitive environment. I tried to create an environment where um, we were holistically trying to get better at everything. We, we were not good enough students in the classroom. We were, we were not investing enough on the field. We were not uh, taking care of the details with nutrition. All those things, being good people. So I tried to invest in all of those areas to build a culture, a healthy foundation while my coaching chops and we're, get, we're getting a little bit more polished. And I can see myself like looking back at Grand Valley and I do the same thing here at Iowa, quite honestly, we're going, oh, that was a mistake. Like I shouldn't have done that or I should have handled this situation better or, you know, and I think, 
as long as long as my heart's in the right place and the student athletes, specifically the female student athletes, know that I care about them, then they're going to do anything they can to do everything for me and our program. Um, because th that's what that's what it's about. It's about the f relationship and in and, and, and daily investments in, in each other. Um, so once we were very competitive out of the gate at Grand Valley. Um, and I would say that by year three, I start was starting to kind of figure out what it was going to take recruitment wise, what it was going to take coaching on the field, what it was going to take on how to fill our roster with people who wanted to be a national champions. How did the opportunity come about to go to Grand Valley? Like, was there a point where you reached at the high school level where you, you were successful and you thought, I'm ready to make that next jump, but how do you end up at Grand Valley? You know, I, ultimately, I had three or four different jobs, um, one of them being full-time as a teacher, and I had a bunch of other soccer jobs. I was tra traveling all summer to try to save enough money for, you know, for my wife and I. Uh, we had the first, you know, birth of our first child. And I was just kind of looked at, you know, looked at each other. And and I was at Hillsdale College, a Division II school, being a part-time coach for men and women. Kind of was like, okay, something has to give. This is getting a little bit much. Um, it's getting stretched. I wasn't able to give enough at home. So Grand Valley was somebody, that, it was an institution that I thought was just the cusp of being special. They had gone really quickly from being a community college to a, a commuter college to a university. Now they were on the edge of being a residential university. They're growing. They hadn't quite yet overcome Western Michigan, Central Michigan, and all those schools with enrollment. But but they were being led by Brian Kelly in football, who's now at, now at LSU, went to Notre Dame. And they had a great athletic director, Tim Salgo. And I thought, let me give this a shot. They're in a good conference um, they hadn't quite made the NCAA tournament yet. They hadn't won the GLIAC yet. And honestly, like every other job in, you know, in every profession, you need somebody to help your resume not get thrown in the garbage. Uh, I had one person who helped me in the department say, hey, take a look at this guy. I know he's a high school coach, but he's won a lot. Give him a chance. Give him a phone call or interview. Um, and then the kind of the, the rest is history. I got Funny enough, uh, one of my SWAs, Lisa Sweeney, at the time, uh, wonderful mentor, would always say once a year, I don't know how you got this job. You're based on your resume. You shouldn't have got this job, but you did a great job, and we're proud of having you. And she's just kind of a little bit turned the screws on me here and there. But um, I, I'm, I'm internally grateful that Tim Salgo, Lisa Sweeney, uh, gave, gave a high school coach an opportunity. You mentioned earlier too about how your passion was ahead of maybe your like knowledge and your ability to, I guess, technically coach. How important has that ability of being curious and being a like a constant learner been for your development as a coach? Uh, I think for me, it's been it's been the most important ingredient for me to you know getting better. I think um, I surround myself, uh, March, uh, you know, with people that are that way as well. You know, all my assistant coaches are that way. I have a pretty decent coaching tree of people who have moved on to big programs as head coaches and, and are doing the same. My director of ops is that way. Our two managers are that way. I think um, every job has ups and downs. Every job is not as, not as glamorous as you think or you, what you hope it to be. So then when you are, when there are downs, when there are dark moments, you want to surround yourself with people that uh, see the light at the end of the tunnel that are passionate about what you do, that can you bring you quickly back to the ground and say, you know, remind you of the 30 student athletes, women, women student athletes and why you do it for, you know, why you do it. Um, you, know, you do it for the game. You do it for growth and development. We have three very simple goal goals, be a better person, be a better student, be a better soccer player during your time at Iowa. And, and I think, it also it always helps you the love and passion that you have uh, for to being better to grow and improve um, and the why you do it always brings you back when things get dark and, and whether that be a loss 
um, whether that be something that her happened personally, um, it, it can always be very helpful to kind of, you know, help you be grounded. The other thing I was thinking about was what was the move like when you've spent your, you know, your entire life in Canada and then was it a difficult move to come to uh, Michigan at Spring Arbor and then to stay and be at Grand Valley? And now, of course, you're at Iowa. What's that been like, at least for like your parents and all that kind of seeing you <laughs> going away? I, I've tra- I traveled a lot when I was younger and youth uh, hockey and, and soccer. We traveled a lot. We said so we were in the U.S. in the United States a lot. Um, so that wasn't that wasn't uh, abnormal for me. So I was very comfortable with that. I, I, I'm very comfortable with change. Um, I think that being in Michigan, four hours away from, you know, my hometown was, was, a, was a lot different than being 11 hours away from, you know, my hometown in Iowa City now. Uh, I try my best to get back and stay connected with my brother, my sister, my, my mother, and my grandparents and whatnot. Um, but I think my personality – is pretty suited to change. It's pretty suited to it. Um, I'm comfortable with uh, adjusting to be, you know, distance. I, you know, I've been gone. I've been in the U S I think it just turned that I've, I've been in the U S longer than I was in Canada. I've been in the U S for instance, 1993. So it's been, it's been interesting to think about that, how long it's been, but you know, you surround yourself with people that, that love you and people that support you here. And, Obviously, I, I, my wife was a softball coach or a softball player at, at Spring Arbor as well. So her fa- her entire family is in Michigan. They're wonderful people. Um, my friends visit. So it wasn't as big a transition as maybe it would have been for my wife to do that. She doesn't love change. She doesn't love every move has been has taken uh, months, you know, to, to help transition being farther away. And so that also probably speaks to why. I've been at two great institutions, but it's also why I have, I've only moved twice. That was something I was going to ask about is what, what has that dynamic of having your wife, that support um, you just talked about, maybe not open to change a lot, but what has that been like to have her through the, the Grand Valley now at Iowa, even the time when you're at Spring Arbor, what has she meant to you in terms of your coaching journey? I mean, it's, it's been the only reason why I've been able to do this, uh, to be honest, you know, you, I think every coach will tell, will say the same thing. And, um, whether it be husband, wife, uh, um, you know, whoever the spouse is, you have to have, um, support and you have to have support because not only is your life changing, our lives are changing. And whether you have children and while, when you move and you change institutions, you, you are moving on and trying to, you dive right into the program and you dive, you know, when I moved to, you know, when I moved to Grand Valley, I was on my own for three months living in a grad, you know, grad assistant apartment while my, my wife was taking care of, you know, a newborn and she tried to come up, but, you know, and finishing teaching. And so you leave, you leave them, your spouse with a mess essentially that they have to clean up and they have to sell the house. They have to prepare the house to be sold. They have to, you know, and, and it's hard. And so I think everyone can needs to champion their spouse because it's the only reason why you can actually do your job, you know, and, and you feel guilty a little bit, but one, you know, once you get them there, you know, you, then everything kind of, you know, settles a little bit, but then, you know, I've been lucky enough to be at two great institutions where I've, I've not wanted to move or had, hadn't, you know, had the need to move. Um, but, um, the spouses are the cog to the wheel that spins, you know, in the coaching coaching profession. So how long you talk about being at two institutions, how long were you at, at Grand Valley? I was there 11 years. So, I was there 11 years from uh, 03 to uh, 13, 2013. So I was, I was there a long time. And then uh, I left and Jeff Hostler was uh, hired right after me. What is one of the pros or one of the things that you enjoy about being there for those long, longer span of time when you can see five, six, 10 years down the road and you look back? What's, so, what's one of the things that you love about that? 
Well, I mean, I'll give you two. The people were unbelievable. Um, and, and the ability to win national championships, you know, I think ultimately it's a division two school, but it's the biggest school in the country for division two. And, um, the athletic director, Tim Selgo has fought a lot of, and Kerry Becker right now as well has fought a lot of pressure to move to division one because he wanted to give the student athletes a unique, special experience and to win, win a lot, win trophies, um, to play in final fours. I had, um, the, the luxury of being in 11 years playing in eight final fours and, um, you know, winning three national championships and losing three other national championships. So, um, that's a pretty, that's a press pretty special experience. With all of that success, how does one come back the next year and keep that standard at that level? Like you always talk about it's hard to once you've won, it's even harder to stay on top. How do you how did you keep that success rolling? I think that's probably the biggest thing that people don't understand. You, you know, sustaining sustaining success is the hardest work. You know, there isn't a program, and I think. Um, you know, it takes a lot of energy and effort um, and commitment to be able to, as a, with the coaching staff, but also players, to be able to um, invest the, the, the energy necessary to be successful. Um, but what I will say is that once you have the standard, it and, you know, great programs are led, great programs are led by the student athletes, by the players. They're led – they set the standard. They set the commitment. They set the investment. Good programs are led by coaches. And I had, I told the story to our leadership group here um, a couple of weeks ago before they left for school or for the summer. The greatest programs I've ever had, the, 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 um, the standards and the expectations were communicated and held by the players. And at Grand Valley, about 20, 2006 was when I knew we were, had something special and I could take my foot off the gas a little bit when it came in that regard with standards and expectations, because we had people who wanted to win. They're, they're, they're willing to put the net, the necessary energy and effort into um, getting better. And then they, they helped build um, the foundation and the culture it wasn't just led by me. One of the things I loved you talk about earlier was uh, building relationships specifically with female athletes. What is it about the female athlete that you enjoy coaching so much? You know, I've coached, I've coached both uh, men and women. I think it's just a little bit more rewarding, you know, when things go well, I think um, there is such an investment personally in, in, in the process, specifically, if they know you care, you know, they, if they know you care, they'll do, they'll, 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 they'll do anything to, to get better for them, but not only for themselves, but, um, for their, 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 their teammates and, and for the program. And I think that the personal relationship that you build that goes beyond the four years, you know, you recruit somebody two years beforehand, you have four years at your institution, sometimes five. Um, but really, it's it's the lifelong relationship that you have with, you know, with them. That is really the real reason why I do it. Um, I need to be a much better communicator to my alumni in tw my 20 years worth of alumni. But the one thing I do is I have every birthday in my phone of every student athlete that I've ever coached. So one day a year, I'm able to commit, you know, commit the time and energy to be able to text them. Happy birthday. How are you doing? Where are you at in life? What's the family look like? Where are you living? And it might be five text messages and then done for a year. Others, I maybe text a bit more, but to me, that is, one of the most special things that I've ever, that I ever have in my life is that I have some version of 400 alumni that are in my phone, their birthdays. And I can tell you that it's just as special when it reciprocates the other way. My birthday is May 31st. And it is amazing. The amount of text messages I get back from players that not all had great experiences on the field, 
or they had good experiences, you know, between the two of us in terms of why we did what we did and the four year commitment, you know, as a student athlete or whatever institution I was at. How important uh, you talk about the text messages and the conversations you've even given examples of having conversations about what it looks like to be a leader and to deal with like paranoia and not let others, how important is the off the field as much as the on the field as a coach? I, I think it's, I mean, 30% of my day, I think they, this statistic just came out. 30% of college coaches is coaching. That's all. That's what we do. Right. It would be great if it was a hundred percent, but it's not right. And it's, uh, you play a lot of different roles. And, and um, I just said this to a student, a student athlete the other day that just committed to the University of Iowa. I don't take that commitment lightly. I don't take that responsibility lightly. To me, it's incredibly important that, you know, the, the parents and the student athletes know that, that, you know, for that four years, five years, I'm going to see them more than the parents will. And so the, the relationship, that we have is going to be really important. The, the communication and the transparency we have, that's going to be really important. The honesty that we have with each other is going to be really important. And that all builds a trust. Um, and it's not just a trust for me to them, but it's them to me. And, and it goes both ways. And I think that is really important because there are very few female student athletes that can succeed on the field without feeling that they're supported by their coach, by their assistant coaches, by their director of ops. Um, they have to feel like they're supported and there's a, there's the reason why they're doing it um, because it's a process and they, they, you know, it's a journey and um, they have to know that there's a why to it. And it's got to, they have to know that it's more than just about playing time. It can't, it has to be more than just playing time. I care about these these female student athletes as women, but I also care about them as, you know, with, with regards to their, as a soccer players and, and their, their experience on the field. So you're at Grand Valley having lots of success. What is the impetus to maybe go to end up at Iowa? How does that come about? Um, I think for me, I, I could have stayed there. I could have stayed there for the rest of my career. Um, I really could have. Uh, I'm, you know, I, I love Allendale. I love Grand Valley State. I love the people that are there. Most of the coaches, most of the coaches are still there. My daughter, my oldest daughter goes back to school there. The one that was uh, a, a one-year-old when she was, when we moved. Um, for me, it was professional curiosity and wanting to challenge myself and see what I was able to do um, against uh, different coaches, higher level players, different conferences where, um, and, and I don't think it was about investing more and more stress that I, that I thought was going to come into play with this. If you want to win, you want to do well, you're going to always be put pressure on yourself. It was just about what more could I do and what more was I able to do, you know, and that, that was it. It was just professional curiosity. We would play a lot, all the division one schools in the spring, we'd play Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio State, Western Michigan. We'd play them all in the spring, do pretty well. That was great. I thought we we were a Division II program, but really with Division I talent. But it was more about me, what I thought I could do, what I, what, you know, answering some of the questions that I still had uh, personally. And, um, you know, for me, I had a lot of opportunity in terms of moving to institutions at mid division one levels, but I just didn't think they were better jobs than what I had. Uh, for me, it was a BCS school that I thought was going to be the difference. Um, and all the facets of why you make a move. And I, again, I had somebody to help me, um, you know, move a resume from one pile to another. Um, and then it was up to me to interview to, to get on campus and win the job. So in both opportunities, both stops here at Grand Valley and now at Iowa, someone else has kind of stepped up for you. How how cool is that to know that others see your potential and your quality as a coach and as a person? I mean, it's it's 
I mean, who, how people think of you and how people see you, I think is what one of the, the very few things that we can take with us at the end of the day, you know, and, you know, when we leave a, when we leave a job, when we, when we leave a city, when we leave life, how people, your reputation, your character, um, how you treat people. Um, I think those are the only lasting impressions that we have. And, and I, I, I feel like I'm a good person. I try to do my best every day. Do I make mistakes? I make a ton. Um, but, but how you treat people, how they feel valued by you and vice versa, I think are incredibly important characteristics. Um, and, and, you know, I still remember to this day, the two people that helped me get the job or helped me get in the door so that I could help promote myself. Um, and I, I'm still internally thankful of them. You talked about at Iowa, your staff is growing. Um, and at Grand Valley, I'm assuming that you had a quality staff there too. What things are you looking for in your staff? Are you looking for ones that are similar to you that fill maybe gaps that you have? Um, what's your thought process in terms of building a staff that you feel will help complement your coaching style? Well, I think what, number one, I, I actually like, we did, we take, we don't do this on the interview, but we do per, uh, uh, personality testing. So it's always, it's always helpful if we all are a different number so that we can kind of cover each other's basis. We can, you know, my strengths can, you know, um, are different than somebody else's strengths and, and the vice versa and help each cover each other's areas of growth or need or weaknesses. Um, I like lifelong learners, hard workers. Um, I think this is a difficult job. It's an amazing job, but it's a hard job. Um, so I growth minded people, lifelong learners, hard workers. I like people who want to be head coaches. I, I, I don't mind somebody who's a lifelong assistant. That's not a, that's not what I'm saying, but I, I like people who want to grow, want to lead people, you know, lead uh, programs I'm comfortable with change. So we've had, we've had, you know, assistant coaches that have, that have moved on to, to other, you know, other programs and are leading those programs. I think when you have people that, uh, that aspire to be head coaches, they are, they have a greater understanding of why you do what you do. It's a bit more holistic. Um, and they also can appreciate how to manage people, um, and develop people, not only the people in the staff, but also people uh, that are in your program and then the external affairs that, that also touch your program. How important is it that you, that, that trust both ways between you and, and your fellow coaches in terms of being able to, I know it, when you're the head coach, sometimes it's hard to give up I quote unquote, some of the power and some of the responsibility. How have you adapted throughout even the Grand Valley to now at Iowa with that? I think that's who I am, to be honest. I'm, I'm not a control freak. I think there are things I try to communicate, try to communicate expectations and job responsibilities. And, but ultimately we're a service-based program. And, and as a staff, we help each other. Um, if somebody is overwhelmed with what they got going on, somebody else will step in and help, help pick up the, the, the workload. So I think if it is, it is mirrored from, from me, down, then our, our staff sees it, our, our student athletes see it. Um, certainly there are responsibilities even amongst the classes, but we don't make the freshmen, hey, you're in charge of equipment. You only have to pick up equipment. We all are in charge of the, the aspects of how we run our program. So I think for me, um, I said this earlier, I have lots of, I have lots of flaws, but I think development and mentorship and helping people specifically staff grow within uh, their own, their own skin and grow, you know, grow as assistant coaches and um, develop a conference, a confidence in who they are and feeling valued. Um, I think that's something I do pretty well, to be honest. And, and I'm comfortable if somebody does something better than I do, then they're going to, they're going to have that responsibility. And this is about winning, but there are people there are people who do things that are better than you. And, and that's one of the unique 
aspects of as a head coach, you have to understand that. And because it's it's not my name on the end of wins, it's ours. It's Iowa soccer. And it takes it takes an army to get us there. Um, not just one person. You mentioned earlier uh, when you were at Spring Arbor and you started coaching high school and then you had were helping out at the Division II level and all of that. And you said there was just something you had to give. Now that you're further along in your career, how do you find that balance? How do you find the balance of, hey, I'm coaching, I'm here at Iowa, but also I'm gonna, I've am gonna, i got to have time for my family. I mean, you got one that's going to college and all that type of stuff. I think, you know, it's a cyclical, it's a cyclical job. You know, there are, you know, the months that there's a little, it's a little slower. We have a dead period in December. May is uniquely slow. Once the port transfer portal closes, uh, you can get out, spend more time going to watch my, my daughter play soccer at her games or spend more time with my wife on the weekends or, you know, have staff outings outside of the office or get in the golf course. So, I think to me, you know, we're, we're on a computer right now. We have phones. We, you don't have to just be in the office all the time. Um, certainly collaboration is important. I think having staffs that are around each other, good ideas come from collaboration and being around each other. But I think it's, it's all about the time periods in the year. You know, yep, fall is about winning. It is about you have to put all your time and energy in performance and in in the program i think you know you find trying to find a, a healthy rhythm in in not only how you build the program uh you ask the student athletes right now i want them to take some time to themselves you know june 1st now it's go time you know so it's all it's it's all about balance so it's, it's i believe life is about balance you know whether that be eating working out working all of the, all of the above. Um, I think if you have a healthy balance, you help each other with that process. I've many times told an assistant, Hey, go home, you know, go home. You don't stay because I'm here or I'll leave at a certain time knowing that they're going to follow me and helping them find balance in life. Cause I want them to have relationships. I want them to go out and, and, and enjoy themselves in Iowa city. I say it's pretty cool. Um, so I think it starts with me and trickles down. As you look forward in terms of your coaching and the Iowa program, what are some of the things that you're hoping to continue to build on and in, into the future? Well, I, I, I want to continue, you know, to sustain, you know, great women, student athletes to graduate from the university of Iowa. I think that's really important. I think uh, investing in the process and being a good human being, you know, investing in the best of your ability as a student athlete, um, both in the classroom and on the field. All of our careers and experiences in the classroom aren't always going to go how we thought they were going to go. But investing to be the best you can be during that time that you're on campus, I think that's going to be really important. I think if we, if we commit the energy necessarily to be successful – we'll at least give ourselves a chance in the end. And, you know, that's something that Tim Selgo, one of my athletic directors, great, greatest mentor I've had would always say, just commit the energy necessary to be successful. And you'll, you will, you'll have a chance of competitive greatness. And if we can do that um, every day and co commit, you know, the time and energy to, to recruit the right people, um, at the University of Iowa, then when, you know, this year, this fall comes, we're going to be in the in a place to, to win the games we need to win, which has predominantly happened every year for us. We're going to we're going to be in a good place in 2024 when UCLA and USC come. Um, we're going to turn out great, great women student athletes to get jobs anywhere in the world with a Big Ten degree. So I think it's all about the process for me and investing the right amount of time. David, this has been awesome, and I'm going to end it on that great setup that you just did. This is Kieran with Coach's Corner Chats with David Diani, and I'm out. Peace. Thank you so much.